All right, hello everyone. Today is, what did I say, June 5th, 2019. And this is the Atlanta FileMaker Developers Group. Uh, let's go around the room and we'll start our introductions. Hi, Christy with Mike Advantage. Hi, Todd Daniel with Seven Spring Solutions. <laughs> Camera broke. Sorry about that. Hold on a second. All right. Sorry. I literally just started clicking and breaking. Joe Martin, 360 Works. Hey, Louie, great to have you. Junior from 360 Works. Hi, Sean from 360 Works. Uh, Joshua from 360 Works. Sorry about this. Uh, all right, it's back. All right, everybody. Uh, my name is David Nadel from Blue Feather, and today's presenter is Louis De La Parra from Seed Code. He's going to be presenting on how to use Node-RED and FileMaker Data API to connect IoT devices. Um, so, Louis, I'm going to pass this over to you right now. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Um, my name is Lou De La Parra. I'm uh, now with Seed Code. I actually just started a, a new job on Monday, so I'm very excited to, to say that. Uh, I wanted to talk with you folks today about Node-RED um, and then Dropship, which is a um, FileMaker clip manager that I've been working on that is currently in a public beta. Um, let me share my screen real quick here. So uh, last year at the uh, Famica Development Conference at DevCon, um, Robert Halsey got on stage and he showed off um, connecting an IoT device, particularly a particle device, um, to the cloud and then to a Famica server. And I thought that that was really, really cool. Um, and it's something that I wanted to not only do, but I wanted to kind of do one better and kind of up the scale on how we could connect to FileMaker um, and these devices. And it turns out that um, the devices that um, are generally referred to as IoT tend to be very uh, lower end hardware or very, um, I don't want to say simplistic, but uh, very um, basic in their programming abilities. And there's a lot of different languages. Um, there is, it, things are written in Python, JavaScript, um, predominantly C, um, and just a smattering of other languages. There's also a lot of devices. There's particle devices, there's Raspberry Pis, there's Arduinos. So right away, I looked at, at the challenge of connecting IoT devices to FileMaker, and I said, OK, well, Rather than write a different client for each individual device, I'm going to go one step up, um, and I'm going to try to run to create a client that will actually allow you to connect to multiple different devices, regardless of the software that they're running. As long as they can connect to a cloud, um, they'd be able to connect to FileMaker. And what I came across is Node-RED. And a very, very uh, good way of putting Node-RED is Node-RED is a programming tool for wiring together hardware devices, APIs, and online services in new and interesting ways. Uh, you can see that right there on the front of their site. They do a very good job at the site kind of explaining what it is. And as I walk through today, I'll kind of explain that to you. Um, just give a little bit of, kind of context on how this works with FileMaker. Uh, you'll notice here when it, where it shows a browser-based flow editing, um, that is how you deploy things with Node-RED. You would deploy them on a canvas, and then you deploy them out to the cloud to actually work in production. We're going to see that in just a minute. It's run on Node.js, and it's got a very big social development aspect to it. There's a lot of community sharing, and we'll see that in, in a little bit. Uh, but before we get into uh, Node-RED, let's talk a little bit about the client that actually runs Node-RED. Um, some of you folks may have heard it, and I will really quickly link to it. It's ludog slash FMS API client. Uh, this is a FileMaker API client, 16, actually, not 16, 17 and 18 FileMaker uh, API client. This client has been under development for about a year and a half. Uh, I started it just before FileMaker uh, 16 data API came out. Um, and this client really does everything you could think of uh, related to the FileMaker data API. You have things like, oh, head back up a little bit. You have things like, um, creating records, getting record details, listing records, finding records, edit records, deleting records. And if we wanted to take a look at like what a create record looks like, um, you can see the documentation here. It's uh, client.create, layout, data, parameters. And I even go in and give you a little bit more detail as far as what a create might look like. And if we were to kind of parse this out a little bit, um, you see that there's a, a method here, and it takes a client, and then that client goes through and 
uh, creates a hero in this case. In this case, creates George Lucas as a hero. Um, so that's what what's required to actually create a record with uh, with the following data API using using this client. So I wrote this client. Uh, it worked really well. I've used it in production um, in a, quite a few different places. It's very very scalable. Um, but there wasn't a lot of adoption uh, for this client with the use of IoT, mainly because it's just kind of a hub in the wheel. Um, so what I did was I actually took the methods that this client um, exports, and I created a UI to go on top of it. So uh, what you're seeing now is Node-RED. Um, and in just a few minutes, I'm going to walk through the areas of Node-RED, and we'll kind of do a little tour so everyone's a little bit more familiar with it. But before we jump into that, I'd like you to take a look on the left-hand side. You'll see if I scroll far enough down, you'll see that uh, those same methods that we saw uh, with the FMS API client are listed here um, in kind of these teal bubbles. We can call that teal on the left-hand side. Um, particularly, if you take a look, there's create. Um, and so this create that, that I've just dragged on the screen here um, is the same create that we saw in FMS API client. It's just now wrapped inside of a Node-RED UI that we can very easily drag across the space. Cool. So we've established that the FMS API client um, lives inside of each one of these nodes. Um, it then becomes a question of like, okay, how do we program in Node-RED? How do we get things to go from a starting point or starting event um, to an ending event? And uh, we do that by grabbing things on the left-hand side, what we call your palette, drag them into your uh, node surface area, and then optionally looking at some information. Um, so if I were to ask um, anyone here today to create a, a record and then edit it within FileMaker, we could grab something like the create node. Um, and then on the left-hand side here, you see that there's some information about the node. Um, I've gone through and actually documented each individual node that you see on the left-hand side um, with documentation on the right and then further documentation. Um, so tricky things in the, the FileMaker data API like um, setting data or running scripts. You can see very easily that um, scripts is an array um, and that it this, it's a array of scripts to run. If you wanted more info from that, you can click on the more info. It would actually take you to the underlying documentation. And that documentation, you could see that, okay, yeah, scripts is an array. It takes a name, a phase, a parameter, um, and there's three of them. And it happens to be that, oh, Han Solo and Greedo are at most Eisley and Han shot first. A little spoiler alert, but that is actually what happens. Um, so, um, just to recap that, just make sure that I've, I've kind of fleshed that out a little bit. On the left-hand side, we have our palette, right? The, the actions we could take with, with FileMaker. Um, in the middle, we have our workspace, and that's the flow or the thing that we're going to be doing. And then on the right-hand side, we have information about either the flow that we're interacting with or the node itself. Um, the information will become very important later on as we configure this node. So I, I went through that somewhat fast. I want to give everyone a, a minute to maybe catch up or ask any questions. Anyone need me to review the layout anymore? I don't have any questions on the layout that I can answer now. Um, so this, <clears throat> uh, the, the nodes that you have on the left, these are available because of that, uh, that, that project that you were showing us before. Is that right? Yes, that, that's exactly right. Uh, the question was, the nodes that are on the left-hand side, they're available because of the project. Yes, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the palette on the left-hand side and the methods that are exposed with the FMS API client. So uh, these things here, like create records, get record details, list records, find, you'll see them here, create, edit, list, find. Um, and I will say, you're currently looking at this uh, pre-18 update. I have, an, I have an update coming out um, in just a couple of days, we hope, depending on, on how the tests and things run. That will add some of the stuff that the Fomica did, did 18 API added, like uh, metadata to get layouts and fields. And later on in this discussion, we'll actually explore how that can be used to build flows dynamically. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I'm kind of wondering: is it just sort of some some node magic where you can point you can you can point Node Red to a specific like NPM repository, and it's able to parse out all of the methods that you've made available inside your inside your, your FileMaker project? Oh man, I wish. Um, I'm sure that given enough time, something like that could be developed. Uh, but no, I wrote I wrote this wrapper by hand. 
Okay. Um, it took me, I think, about four and a half months. Altogether, between FMI CPI client and this, I think we're, we're about two years deep in, in, in my support of both the projects. Um, and it is, I'll head there real quick, because it's pretty easy to get to. Um, it is a separate project that you could see in and of itself. Let's take, a, let's take a quick detour and take a look at that. So the project itself is Node-Red Contrib FileMaker. Uh, it also has a, a GitHub home. Um, and so you can see here's all the flows for that. Um, you mentioned kind of like what, is it, what does it look like underneath the hood. Um, if you take something like this, like the edit node, this is what the UI looks for the edit node. But if you were to abstract that into um, JSON or JavaScript terms, it would look like this. Um, and it really is just um, a JSON object that describes the flow. Um, so this is what you're actually creating when you're um, connecting things via the UI. Um, what I've done for every method that, I, that I've created, I've created both an illustration and a flow for you to copy and paste. And we're going to later on, we're going to go through and actually copy and paste and create a few of these. Um, if you're really interested in what it looks like underneath the hood, you can, of course, go to the, the GitHub documentation. Let's, because I showed you the create, let's do, um, Oh, this is not the right project. This is the project. Sorry. Let's go through and just look at what a create might look like. So there's actually two things with Node-RED. There's a JavaScript file and an HTML file, um, obviously for the UI and then for the back end. This is what the create looks like with the JavaScript file. Um, again, you don't need to know JavaScript in order to dive, dive into this. Um, I just want to really quickly call out, this is that method that we saw earlier. Right? It's just wrapped in a bunch of UI um, that enables you to get to this point of creating a record um, easily. We're still providing the layout. We're still providing data. Um, and in this case, I'm casting a few helpers to help you with the parameters. Um, but it is very much still the, the underlying FMS API client uh, that we saw earlier. OK. Cool. Thanks. Awesome. So um, OK. Awesome. I gave, spent the last 15 minutes or so just going, after, going over Node-RED. But I haven't really said like how this um, turns into being able to connect IoT devices or even create APIs and, and why we even care so much that uh, we want to take a look at it. Um, and in my mind, the answer is because this flow follows very closely to what we would do in real life. If, if we're developers and we're sitting down to look at a business process, the business process is going to start at a certain time. It's going to go through a few actions, and then it's going to end. If, it, if we're in FileMaker, that might be you know starting a script. The script has a few script steps, and then the script exits with a result. That's exactly the same thing we have here. Do you notice on the left-hand side, I have an inject node um, that is starting off this uh, flow. And then on the right hand side, I have a debug node, which in this case isn't necessarily ending the flow, it's just going to print it out to the sidebar, but it's going to allow us to see what kind of transpires. So flows always go from left to right. So I'm going to trigger this on the left, and then we're going to see the information on the right. Um, and in between those flows, the actions we're going to take is we're going to create Anakin Skywalker. You may have heard of him. He's a pretty cool Jedi. Um, mm -hmm. And then we're going to edit him, and spoiler alert, we're going to edit him to create Darth Vader. It, it's been about 30 years or so since that movie came out, so that shouldn't be too big of a spoiler. Um, I'm going to trigger this node um, by clicking the button on the left-hand side. That's going to start the node, and we're going to kind of watch it go through the process and then break down what, what happens within this process. So I'm going to hit start on the left-hand side, uh, and if you take a look on the right-hand side, I now have uh, my output. It's a little blurry. I'm just trying to make this a little bit bigger for everyone. Um, and if you notice, my, my output is, is JSON. It's an object, uh, and then it has layout, data, update, create, and edit. And they're all objects as well. And if we were to open these up, you see that, OK, data is Anakin Skywalker. Update is Darth Vader. And then we have create with a record ID and a mod ID and edit with a mod ID. Well, this information up here, um, although Anakin Skywalker and Darth Vader are the same person and they a really cool person, um, aren't as necessarily important to what we're talking about with the data API. This information out at the bottom, the create and the update, those are the responses from the FileMaker data API. The record ID is the record ID that, that has been created in FileMaker. The mod ID is the modification ID for that particular record. Um, in this case, you'll notice that create, well, don't click on it, uh, create has a mod ID of zero, because it was created then with a record ID, and then edit has a mod ID of one, meaning that we just updated that particular record. Pretty cool, right? Everyone kind of understands how that works. Left-hand side, the flow starts. It flows through each individual node, which takes an action, and then we see it on the right-hand side. Not so bad. 
Couple little detours here though. Um, I've chosen to print out everything in this way, uh, meaning by putting into an object with data, update, create, and edit as main properties and layout as main properties, but you wouldn't necessarily do that um, in production or within a flow. You generally manipulate what's called the payload. And you can kind of see that up here. And again, if this is a little small, I apologize. Um, it says message.payload. This entire flow is going to act upon a message. And each node in the flow is going to take in a message and then um, return a new message hopefully a new message, sometimes a modified message, and then return a new message. Uh, and that's how things get, get kind of stringed together, right? The start starts with just empty, right? It's gonna start with probably just, actually in this case, the layout, the data, the name and the update, right? So the thing I wanna do, um, and that's the starting message. This is what's called the message payload. And then create is going to take the payload layout and the payload data and then do something with it. In this case, it's going to create a layout. Now I've just exposed a brand new UI pane, so let's take a quick second and talk about it. Um, every node that it can get put onto this workspace um, has a configuration pane, and that's actually what you see here. And as I click on each individual uh, creation pane, uh, it opens up and I can see the settings for that node. Um, the settings for each individual node uh, do change, right? Obviously, create is going to have things related to creation. Uh, global setting of global um, fields are going to have something to do with uh, configuration to do with setting of globals. Um, but the one thing you should know about them all is they will usually inherit from message and usually message.payload uh, and they're configurable. Um, and that's because when I first started out building this, this node red connector, what I found was is that no IoT device and no API really speaks the same language and in the same way, right? We'd like to say that they all speak JSON um, or at least JavaScript, right? But that may not necessarily be true. And where their properties are may not necessarily line up with where I need them to be. If I'm taking in data from an API, I can't necessarily control where the properties are for that data, right? I may want to call my primary ID, primary ID with a capital I, and that API may actually just give me the ID with just ID underscore, under, underscore ID, right? I don't necessarily have control of that. So what I did when, when working with Node-RED here is I've made it very, very configurable to manipulate your output as you're putting things together. So in this case, um, if message.payload.layout didn't exist, I could change this to a string and just call this string people. And now when this record gets created, it's going to take it from the string that I inputted here. Well, I didn't save that. I should probably do that, should probably do that again. String people done deploy, got to deploy. There we go. And now it's taken from the string. Um, it might turn out later on down the road that I can, I don't know, get the layout metadata from a FileMaker file. And that layout metadata may be in message.payload.layout oh, metadata. And so I could pull from that as well. Man, don't type live. Never a good thing. <laughs> Okay, so now in this case, I can configure this to say message.payload.metadata, that is where you should go to get your layout, right? Um, the things that you see in between name and uh, data, this kind of middle section, are required for all the nodes. Um, the things underneath are really optional. Um, and again, like I was saying earlier, if you're curious, like what you can configure here or, or want to go a little bit deeper, I've spent quite a lot of time going through the help documentation and making sure that there's a one-to-one -one, um, link between the things that you see in the configuration pane, uh, a very um, minor set of examples, and then more info related to the actual portion um, that it's corresponding to. Cool. So we know that we can trigger flows. They start from the left to the right. We know that... Um, this entire thing processes a message, uh, usually a message payload, uh, and then each node receives a payload and then returns a new payload. Hopefully, some nodes actually return a modified payload, but that's not necessarily the, the best behavior. Um, so, okay, well, let's look at what we can do with that. We saw that really easily, we could just create a, a record, but that's not necessarily an API, and that's not necessarily IoT. So let's take this a step uh, further. Let's create um, an API, and let's actually go even a step further and create a website. Um, so in this case, I've got a little bit more of a complicated flow. 
delete that off of there. Um, what we'll do is we'll work left to right and then top to bottom to kind of go through how this node works. Again, everything in Teal um, is a file maker action, uh, usually through the data API. Um, so we could talk about that a little bit more in depth and kind of go into that. Uh, what you see on the left-hand side, these two yellow guys, yellow notes, not guys, they're actually no gender, um, list page and, and detail page, um, they're actually just URLs, right? So this is an incoming HTTP request. This is something coming into us. So we're going to serve up a page. In this case, the HTTP method is going to be a get. The URL is going to be Jedi. So what I mean by that is if we were to go to this, well, don't do that. If we were to go to this website, red.mutiffany.com slash Jedi, we would load that website. And actually, when we do that, you see that I have this yeah, kind of basic but nice bootstrap website with a whole with a list. Each item in this list is a file maker record. If I were to click on a record, I would see not a lot of information, but I would see that record's detail. Um, real quick, before we move on, I want to point out the detail simply has the ID in it. So when we go back and we take a look at the second row, um, that is how we're, we're doing the, the second row. There we go. OK, so uh, that is the URL. This is the URL of Jedi list. Uh, I called out the ID. That is this here. Um, see how it's got the, the colon and the ID? That means that it's going to uh, take in an ID. From the HTTP request, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to map it to something that FileMaker understands. Remember, I said the real power uh, that I found that comes from this is that I can map requests from one to another. I can kind of be this, this middleware that kind of massages things into, into the, the form that I need them. So I'll take a look at this function node. And this function node is doing something that we saw earlier, um, but I wanted to add it here so that we um, could dive in a little bit deeper. This function node is setting message layout um, to people. So no matter what request you get from the list page, no matter what, it's going to go to the FileMaker layout that is people, as long as list Jedi is set to message.layout. Let's take a look at that real quick. Yep, the list Jedi message.layout. Um, so you can kind of see there's a little bit of a, of a generator going on. The request is starting on the left-hand side, starting on list. Um, it's being modified, right? Once it gets modified, it gets passed to list Jedi. List Jedi will actually go through and transform the response. And then finally, uh, we create the web page. Let's talk real quick about creating the web page. Um, I know that this is mainly focused on FileMaker, but we do need to look at a little bit of HTML because it's really cool and we should do so. Um, what you'll see here is a template. Um, the astute among you will notice that it really is just an HTML page. Um, I've got some Google Analytics here. Uh, and then I've got something interesting. I've got uh, what's called a handlebar template or a mustache template, depending on who you talk to. Um, and that template takes a payload.jedi. We saw what a payload was earlier. Um, and then from that payload.jedi, we take a name. So that website that we saw earlier, that, uh, that website, that web page that we saw earlier is actually constructed from this. What we we're seeing happen is we we're seeing the request start. It FileMaker is getting the records that it should list. It's being transformed in a way um, that we can plot to a web page. And then we're plotting it with a web page, all within Node Red. Uh, the only processing that is happening on the FileMaker side is the commands uh, in Teal, specifically list and perform define. Uh, real quick, because it's on the board twice, I want to uh, talk about transform response. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it because we, so we don't have a lot of time. Um, transform response, containers, record ID, and field data, these bottom nodes that if you see in the, the bottom left-hand corner, um, those are not necessarily FileMaker data API methods. right? You wouldn't see those. Um, if you were to look in FileMaker's documentation. Those are helper methods that I've added to this specification or to this project um, that I found that people have needed. In particular, transforming response. We all know that FileMaker uh, sends us back JSON with data, right? And then inside that data will be portal data and field data. Um, but as I, as I mentioned earlier, other APIs can't necessarily deal with that correctly. So what transform response does, transform response allows you to go through and actually will change the format of the FileMaker data to something that's a little bit more generic. Um, and it does that by taking table field, right, table colon colon field value that we would see commonly in FileMaker, um, and transferring it to table field value. You could think of this as like unpacking um, a FileMaker table reference, right? It's taking the field and it's putting the field in a property of the table. Uh, very, very useful, particularly when creating um, a website. Okay. 
So um, next up, we have the detail page, right? We saw how to create a list. Let's go a step further and do a detail page, mainly because we could talk about finding. Um, we could see here that with the detail, we're mapping the request, and we're doing something a little bit differently. Um, inside of this function, you notice it says message.query, and then I have ID message.rec.params.id. Well, that message.rec.params was set by our previous node, right? That's the ID that we were that I referenced. Um, and it's set inside of a query object because our perform find is going to go through and look at the query side and say, okay, I'm gonna take whatever's in message.query and I'm actually going to perform a find for any file maker files that match that. Uh, but that's not necessarily enough, right? It is entirely possible that somebody puts in a random ID um, in our website, and we don't want to necessarily just show nothing. So we need to go through and, and take another step and actually check the data length. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to perform a find. From that find, we're going to say, OK, like, did we get anything back? If we did, we'll return it as one. Right, return no on a message. If we didn't, return a message and no. So just kind of doing like a, a real quick and easy switch statement um, to just say either we're going to show the web detail page or we're going to show a not found page. Um, so and I'll show you that real quick. This is the web detail page. Uh, just like we saw earlier, but a little bit more basic than we saw earlier, we're setting a uh, name to payload.data.name. Awesome. And so that is how you could create a totally independent website from FileMaker data. Um, using an API. Any questions on that? That's pretty cool. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah, I have a lot of fun making this stuff. Cool. All right, well, let's uh, let's shift. I think I have till 5 o'clock. Is that right? Yep. Mm -hmm. 5 o'clock my time, I should say. Mm -hmm. I'm in Pacific time. OK, so. Um, that is how you would create a website. That's a kind of front end rendering, um, if you will. But what about working with IoT? Right? IoT is kind of a different beast, right? It's not necessarily going to call a web page and then read results. We're probably going to listen for an event. Um, and one of the things that works really, really well, and it was ever used a particle device, um, is particle cloud. Particle Cloud um, is a service that you get when you buy one of their devices um, that allows your device to actually talk to a cloud. Um, not whenever it wants, but on a scheduled basis to, to give data. And one of the great things we can do is we can actually listen for that data um, using Node-RED and then send that data to FileMaker when and only when it's applicable. Um, but we'll skip over that one. No, that's not the one we want just yet. All right, air quality. Um, what you're seeing here is another flow. Uh, the blue node that's on the left-hand side um, is a particle subscription for air quality. Um, so what you're seeing here is anytime a particle device reads the air quality of a particular area, it's going to go through and it's going to send a record, or it's going to send data to Node-RED in order to create a record. Um, so you can see here on the left-hand side, you have air quality. That is the event we're receiving information from there. On the right-hand side, we have create record. That is when we're actually entering the information into, into FileMaker. Right? But there's kind of a lot in between. And the lot in between is actually where the power of Node-RED um, comes into play. FileMaker is really good at, at storing our data, right? We know that once it's in FileMaker, the data is reasonably safe unless something happens to our server. FileMaker is also really good um, at serving UI to our end users, right? It's a really good platform if you want to be able to distribute software quickly. Um, but because of those two things, it is not necessarily the best platform to deal with event-driven architecture, meaning um, architecture that would allow you to receive an event or do a thing, um, kind of like IoT, right? And Internet of Things means there's a lot of things talking to your server. And that's really where Node-RED comes in. And it's the marriage between Node-RED and FileMaker um, that really helps us design this sort of thing. Um, the yellow nodes that you see here are essentially um, delta nodes. Um, and filter nodes that allow us to not create records in FileMaker when those records aren't applicable to anything that we're doing. So in this particular case here, I'm setting the topic to core ID. Now, core ID is kind of like the unique identifier for a particle device. Um, and it's entirely possible that my particle device, something could go wrong with it, and it could send 30 or 40 messages within a second, or nah, within five seconds, we'll say. That's a little bit more accurate. Um, at any given time. Well, I don't want all of those records creating in FileMaker. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to filter by my core ID by setting it to the topic, right? I have this property of message.payload.coreID. I'm sending it to my message topic um, and then blocking based on a certain time. I'm filtering out anything that is part of that core ID that is, has the same published time. So if there's two of the same uh, pieces of information coming that were published by the same device at the same time, I'm just going to discard one of them. 
right? And what that does is substantially lowers the amount of traffic that my FileMaker file needs to deal with. My FileMaker file then only gets the relevant information um, and my Node-RED um, application is doing the filtering for it. So it's really kind of the marriage of these two things together that, that makes IoT devices um, work well within a, within a FileMaker environment. Cool. So let's take a step further, right? We have Node-RED, and Node-RED is talking to FileMaker. But then what if we want FileMaker to talk back to Node-RED? Right, uh, we have insert from URL. It's a, it's a script step that we can use, and we can use insert from URL to talk to um, other APIs. Well, why can't we use insert from URL to talk to our Node Red server? Have our Node Red server do some things within FileMaker, maybe trigger a few scripts, and then return the results back to FileMaker. Uh, when we do something like that, we actually gain asynchronous, which is, is very very cool. We can fire a script in FileMaker, not wait for that script to return. Um, and then still know that whatever actions that scripts triggered happen within FileMaker without having to wait for them, right? We get we get somewhat of a multi-threaded process. It's still single-threaded, but it, we get somewhat of a multi-threaded process. Um, you can see that here with this particle refresh authentication. Um, I introduced a website. I introduced particle API, I, the particle API in the uh, in the cloud, uh, and I want to communicate between my Node-RED instance, particle, and FileMaker securely, right? I mean, any any developers that's out there knows that if you're going to talk to APIs, you need to do so in a secure fashion. Um, one of the ways to do that is with a, a JWT, a, a JSON Web Token, um, and if you've tried to do this within FileMaker, you'll know that it's very, very difficult because FileMaker doesn't necessarily have the underlying libraries yet that allow you to generate a JWT. But it's very, very easy to do so uh, within Node-RED. There's quite a lot of libraries that allow you to do it. So what you're seeing here is a get call to get authentication tokens. It's performing a find in FileMaker. Based on that find, it's either going to create a new record or update a record, insert a JWT token, and then go about its day. So what this does, I have a, a mobile FileMaker file. Let's say it's um, it's hosted on a FileMaker server and it's on an iPad. And I need to get a new authentication token for, so that my iPad can talk to one of my IoT devices. Um, using a script, I'll hit an insert from URL to get authentication tokens. Right? It's going to perform a find in my FileMaker database. If I don't have a record for a token, it'll create it. Uh, if I do have a record, it'll actually go through and then um, edit the record for me. So that is how you would use um, FileMaker to actually create a record in Node, uh, create a record in Node-RED from FileMaker, kind of like a, a self-fulfilling cycle. Any questions on that? Mm -hmm. I went through that one really fast. Well, at the beginning of that one, when you uh, said you had multiple readings or multiple um, sets of data sent, and you eliminated anything that had the duplicate ID of the particle reader. That's correct. Yeah. Does it take into account um, any of the data? So, like, let's say there are ten readings. Do they? Does it screen to see that they all have the same level measurements and eliminated all complete duplicates, or what if all five had different readings? Uh, that, is, that is that is an amazing question. I've asked that question myself. Um, just to make sure that I, I understand it correctly and that everyone heard it. Um, you're asking is is how um, Complex can you get with the filtering, right? How many properties can you filter on with both published ID? Um, and, and, the, also, and also, how is it that you're doing the quick comparison? Are you creating a record and getting the data into FileMaker and then deleting records once you're comparing, or how is it screening ah, okay. to filter okay, so out which How does it know what it's filtering? Um, and the question is, is, is that filtering happening with FileMaker's input or not? Um, and I think the, the key here is that FileMaker isn't doing any sort of processing so, to know what should be filtered. I could do that, right? I could, if I wanted to, add a find here, right? Connect that find from the core ID back to my filter, and that would allow FileMaker to, oh, that's not right, sorry. That would allow FileMaker to actually go through and provide me data in order to do the filter. Um, but I'm not trying to do that in this case. In this case, um, I'm using something static. So until this create record event, FileMaker doesn't even know something has happened. Um, this is happening based on the message core ID. This property message.topic is being set from this node 
not file Nika's node. Um, and in this case, I, it's very simple, right? Message.payload.publish that. And if your original portion of your question was, well, can you make it more complex? And the answer is yes, most definitely. You, you would just add more filtered nodes, right? And if I added a node by doing this, I'm totally just going to make this up on the spot. This is pseudocode. Um, it could be um, person, right? I, I don't know why. Um, so now it's going to set the core ID, blocked for the published time, and then also blocked for the person, and then finally add the map. So you would just add in additional filters. Before it even gets to file before it even gets to FileMaker, yes. Um, mainly because in this in this case, it's a question of scalability. Um, if I have 200, 300, 400 devices communicating to FileMaker, it'd be very easy for the FileMaker process to just be overwhelmed with the amount of communication that came in. Um, so being able to do some sort of filtering before FileMaker um, gets involved just allows us to add more devices in the field um, without necessarily seeing the impact within within FileMaker. Um, I think though, I, it is a very cool idea of what you have of actually like filtering based on what's in FileMaker. And I would probably do two sets in that case. I would do an initial filter to really um, filter out as much of the data set as I could, and then perform a find in FileMaker or, or perform a script in FileMaker and based on those results, filter out um, the rest. You see that a little bit in, this one, right? This here, I'm performing a find, and then if there is a record, I'm actually going through and either updating that record or creating a new one. That's the sort of the sort of filtering you could do. Um, so, like for your example with the particles and the air, you might want to have the filemaker create an average of whatever records had, eliminating highs and lows, and create an average so that when it spits the number, it's it's not an extreme. That you're exactly right. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, awesome. So I think I've got like 20 minutes left. I'm going to uh, really quickly, I'll go through two more flows and then I have, I, I want to show Dropship and I want to save some time for questions. So um, really quick, I'm going to move on um, to container data um, and then what you can do when you actually start to expand um, your FileMaker flows. And by the way, everything that we were working on um, I, is actually in production. You could go to red.mutesimpity.com, interact with the website if you wanted to. Um, things are updating as I change it. So um, Node-RED allows you to have this really dynamic interaction with your production environment. May or may not be a good thing, depending on how you like to develop. Uh, but real quick, uh, file upload. OK, so um, one thing that happens often and is, is something that we need to plan for is updating of FileMaker binary data, right, containers. Um, and so what we have here is something very close to what we saw originally. We have a file upload. Um, and in this case, um, the URL is slash complex. It's going to inject a JavaScript library, in this case, dropzone.js, which is, is an upload library. It's going to add some web styling, add some CSS for us, create a web page, and then serve that web page up to the user. And just really quickly, because I don't think anyone saw it, um, there is the mustache payload of DropZone.js. So I attached it here in this object library, and then I, I'm actually using it in this create library. Um, and if we were to actually go to that website, see if I can type it correctly the first time. Nope, that's not it. Oh, we see that we have a very, very simple upload field. I'm going to find myself uh, something to upload. Uh, quick screenshot. So if I grab this and I drag it on top of there, uh, my file has been uploaded. And it's actually been uploaded to my FileMaker file via this upload here, right? Um, it's being posted to Upload Pretty. I'm retrieving the file information from the request. And then I'm going through and I'm uploading the file to FileMaker. Um, this in particular, I made some adjustments to the upload file node. Um, with FileMaker, you have to give it um, a stream. In this case, this upload file will extract either a stream or a file. Um, so you can you can hold your files in memory, or if you're going to be doing this um, in production and you have a lot of files, you can store them on a file system and then upload them to FileMaker afterward. Um, I've also given a companion node of extract containers, which does the opposite. It, it goes to FileMaker, gets the FileMaker data APIs, or the web publishing engine, technically, um, URL, and then 
walks through the procedure to actually download that file um, and add it to the filing system or add it to a buffer. So we can also upload um, and download container data. Cool. Uh, last flow, I just want to kind of give you folks a, a sense of scope here. Um, and I'm, I've, we're doing a flow that, that I don't necessarily show often, so it might be a little bit uh, a little little messy. Uh, but what you're seeing here is actually the entire build process for the application I'm going to show you next. Uh, I'm working on an application that's a FileMaker code manager. Um, and that application needs to get built on a particular server, served out to my end users, and then receive feedback from the community uh, as it's received. All of that infrastructure is in one page inside of Node-RED. Um, and I just want to give you a sense for how big you can make these things. Um, this is my OAuth redirect. Um, this is a, a Slack report. So if somebody were to send me a message like, hey, there's a bug, there's a feature we want to see, I can receive that report. It creates a Slack record for me, notifies my end users. If we look further on down the road, there is some interactions with FileMaker. But I wanted to show you the scale of these of Node-RED. Isn't limited to just these simple, um, here's actually another one. This might even be a better example. Um, it isn't necessarily limited to um, the single or multiple node flows that we saw today. Um, you can build some very big and some very advanced things with FileMaker at the heart of your infrastructure using Node-RED. Cool. So I'm, I'm going to end Node-RED there. I'll ask you guys if you have any questions while I set up um, Dropship. Cool. Any questions? Cool. Yeah, no, yeah, no question. It's, 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 it is a lot to take in, but it looks, it's very cool. I mean, I like, I like the plug and play ability of like API calls. Yeah. Yeah, I, and, you know, I originally designed it to work with IoT. That was my initial focus. But what I found later on down the road was you can actually um, create quite a lot of things with just APIs. And the real power comes into when we're actually working with different API endpoints. Awesome. All right, let me move over. So uh, while I'm setting this up, um, anyone that is on um, online can maybe just um, ask in the meetup or just put it on the chat. Um, who here has used um, Clip Manager or um, a text snippet or text expander to actually work with their file maker data? Anybody? I've tried in the past. It's been, I've, I've largely been unsuccessful. Uh, you know, nothing really stuck. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's really, it's tough. Um, and for a long time, you folks can see my screen now, right? Yep. Okay. For, uh, let me just make sure I'm logged in. For a long time, yeah, I am. Okay. For a long time, I would use Clip Manager. Um, and I thought Clip Manager is amazing. It really did all the things I wanted it to do, except for two things. It didn't get updated for a very long time. Um, and it didn't sync across my devices. I tried to make it, maybe put it into Dropbox and, and be able to sync to my different computers that way. Um, and then if I wanted to share a clip that I had made with a friend of mine or someone on my team, I didn't have an easy way to do it. Um, so I eventually just decided I'm going to write my own um, application. And what I'm going to show you today is a beta of that application. Um, this is probably its third public beta that we're about to start in a week or so. Everyone here is invited. Just reach out to me if you want to be a part of the beta. Um, and it's called Dropship. And Dropship is the XML manager for the future. Um, you can see it up here in my taskbar. It's the last item in the taskbar. It looks like a little ship. Uh, when I click on that, I get a drop down um, that allows me to define my hotkey a recall last clip, and then my window positioning. I'm not going to mess with this too much. I just want to show you how this could, how this works. I'm going to open up a fresh FileMaker file. Um, and now the first thing I want to do, actually, I'm going to make a new file, brand new. The first thing I want to do um, is I want to create some scripts. And those scripts are going to have dependencies on, on custom functions. And those custom functions are going to have dependencies on some other things. And there's a lot of things I need to add just in order to get started with my file. So I'll call this my demo file. Uh, what I would do in the past is I would go and and go to my clip manager, copy some things out of it, and then paste it back in. Uh, and what Dropship allows you to do is really quickly and easily search for the things you're looking for. So right away, I know that I need to add some custom functions that I use often. I'm going to bring up my search history, uh, my search bar, which is this bar here, that um, comes up while you're in FileMaker. You never need to leave FileMaker for this to happen. And I'm going to search for my JSON functions. So I'm going to search for JSON. If you see, I actually have a few here. I have FM JSON validation, FM JSON additions. Um, and I'm going to need both of them. But the first thing I'll do is I'll grab FM JSON validation. And then I'll come on over here, much like we would, and I'll go to 
custom functions, and I will paste it in. And then I also really want um, the other validation, the JSON addition. So I'll do the same thing. I'll come back in here, and I'll type in JSON, and there's the additions, and I'll come on over here. Um, what's awesome, what I just did, is you wouldn't necessarily be able to do that um, without this manager, right? You can't leave this dialog box um, until you actually close it and move out of the way. And there's a few areas within FontMaker that, um, that we've been able to break that rule with using this tool. So just like that, I've added all my custom functions. And now I want to write a script based on those custom functions. So come in here. But you know what? This is a file that's going to be dealing with an API. Um, and I like to use generator quite often. Um, so I'm going to go through, and I'll just grab generator scripts. I'll come in here, and I'll type in generator. And it's going to take a second, but there's the generator v2 script. Uh, real quick, I want to point out, um, this is made by Guys Interactive. That makes some awesome stuff. Um, so this is not something I wrote. This is something they wrote. I just use it often. Uh, and I'm going to paste it into FileMaker. Well, maybe not. Oh, it's pasted it as a script step. Sorry. I copied it as a script step before this demo, um, so not as a script. But there's the script steps that are that's part of Generator. Um, but now I'm a, I'm a really good developer, um, and I like to make sure that all my clips are commented. So I will go through and create some comments. I don't want to write it by hand because that takes forever. So come here, and I'll just put in, in my oh, script introduction. Um, and you see here, this has actually information you might want to input. Um, I automatically created my, my author name, the date created, the purpose, the script result, the optional parameters, and the optional callers. And I could change this. This could be, this is custom. And then I'll set my clip here. Um, and then now I have my initial script step. Um, but there's more here, right? I also use perform script on server, and I use it often. And But that's not necessarily um, just one thing, right? That's that's a script step that defines upon a custom function. The first thing I'll do is I'll go in and grab the custom function. So let's see, perform scripts, scripts. Oh, server-side scripting. And I'll go in here and edit. Now I have my function. I'll come in here again. And I'll do the same thing. Oh, that's my email. I want that to come up. And then there's my server-side check. And there, in just what three different keystrokes, uh, I've inputted a custom function. I've added it to my script with the if then to be able to call it. So now I can run this script uh, via a form script on server. Um, OK, pretty cool, right? You, you can go through and um, anything that can be saved to FileMaker clipboard um, can be pasted with, with Dropship. But then even more than that, you can actually share these clips with other people. Uh, and you do that by working with a dropship manager. Um, the dropship manager is how I actually go through and I actually um, can organize, share, and edit my, my clips. It's a fully open FileMaker file that is backed by a fully open API that anyone can go through and tinker with. This file is completely unlocked. You can make it do whatever you want it to do. Um, on the left-hand side, I have my clips um, with some information about them. I have tags, right? And those are the tags that we saw earlier where I can actually say like, oh, I don't want this to be a um, just XML. I want it to be dynamic XML and set things like we saw the date set earlier. So there it says moment format. Um, I'm actually using moment, uh, moment to format the date automatically. And go in here and see the code. Um, here's that script, in, um, script introduction. Here's the returns. Here's that tag, which gets set here. So my returns get set to script results. Um, it's not just about clips, though. We also have this idea of libraries and subscriptions. Um, I love Carbon. I think Carbon's a really good framework. Um, so I've created a Carbon library. And if I wanted to, I can go in here and actually share this library with someone, like, say, Eden Morris, because he's a buddy of mine. Um, and he'll actually get an invite to that library, and he could then access um, those functions as well. Uh, those XML clips. I shouldn't say functions. It's more than functions. Um, so that is my really quick overview of Dropship. Um, it's currently in beta. We want everyone to try it and give us feedback. The reason why we're in such a long beta um, is because we're trying to really see what developers want with this tool, because there's a lot of, way, a lot of directions we could go with it. Um, so yeah, I'd invite everyone to try it out. If you want, just reach out to me um, and ask away any questions you might have. Oh, yeah, I'd like to check that out. Yeah, it's definitely very cool.
Uh, so I know one thing that we've got with our company is like a repository database where we store commonly used functions and scripts and things that we would want to copy and paste uh, between, you know, solutions. Um, so this seems like this is supposed to be an alternative to something like that. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, this you're storing the clips um, in our server. And I know that everyone would initially cringe on that. We have plans on the roadmap to actually encrypt um, your Phonica clip data and to really granularly set your sharing. But uh, the clips are saved on our server and then distributed to um, the people on your team as they are requested. Um, and what that means is twofold. A, you can be anywhere you want um, and access a clip. But B, you can also change a clip, and everyone within your organization gets that change. So if, as an organization, you decide that you're going to do your scripts in a particular way, you can set those as scripts, and then uh, your developers will just instantly inherit those changes. Um, if you find that there's maybe a security vulnerability with one of your scripts, or uh, an, an environment variable got leaked that you need to go and, and remove, well, you can just remove it in one place, and then you know that every place that actually gets that script, every developer that uses that script step or that, that XML clip um, will get that updated clip. Um, again, I'll, I don't want to uh, speak too much in the future because anything that you saw here is something to change at any given time. Um, but one of the things that we're also looking at is uh, dependency tracking um, and dependency management. Um, so you saw that I have uh, eight or nine scripts in my dropship manager. Uh, what I didn't tell you is that as I add them to a library in order to share them with someone else, they're actually version controlled. So if I add a script step, like the script introduction, uh, to a library, and then I change that script introduction, it's going to let everyone else know in the library that it has changed, and then um, allow them to opt in or opt out of that uh, version control change. Uh, the other feature that we're looking at that's kind of along these lines is to actually watch where you're pasting things within a FileMaker file, at least in the name of the file, so that when you do have a clip update, you know exactly what files need to, go, need to be modified um, that you did maybe a week ago or two weeks ago, or, or you know which files you've actually need to change due to that update. So hopefully working on some very rudimentary version control. Cool. That's, that's cool. Seems very useful. Is there a pricing model, or is this? Uh, there is a there is a pricing mod, uh, uh, pricing model. We haven't necessarily um, announced it publicly yet, although I will say that I, I developed this to be a tool um, for myself, I developed, developed it because I wanted it. Um, and I'm very big into sharing. So there will always be a portion of this tool that is free, as long as you're willing to share with the community. Um, it's one thing that I feel very strongly about. Um, if you're willing to share the knowledge that you have with other people, we want to give this to you in some sort of a free way. We don't necessarily know exactly how that's going to look yet. But uh, the people that contribute to clips in the ecosystem will, will be able to use this without paying in some way. Is there anything in Dropship for layout creation? Yeah, so um, actually, I'll, all right, I'm going to end, end with a little bit of a maybe, maybe wow moment, maybe not. Um, you can, like we saw earlier, I'll just grab something here. Let's say I wanted to grab this layout object. Um, again, anything that can be put into, um, into a, a, a clipboard can be added. So this is a button, right? I just copied and I just created it here. And I'll sync it to my server. And then there's the button. And there it is. So there's the second button. So anything in the layout, again, if it can, if it can get put into um, the clipboard, we can we can modify it and then serve it back to you. So layered objects also um, work. But then even cooler than that, who's used FMSVG before? Anyone? FMSVG? FMSVG.com. Uh, really cool uh, website. I use it often. I'll bring it up real quick because it's, it's worth it. And so could that do layouts as well? So on a clipboard, if you had like fields and navigation bar and stuff and you pasted it in with the field, would be um, not attached to any defined field if, it, if you use that placement? Yeah, so um, yes, that, your question was if I have a, if I have a layout uh, and I want to copy some things in the layout and then I go to paste it back in, um, is it what it what field is it connected to? And there's really kind of two answers to that. 
Uh, one is that if the reference is broken, which depending on where you are in FileMaker, that may or may not be a big deal. A lot of times the references will kind of self-heal. Um, and then the other answer to that is, well, I showed you kind of templating and actually adding in your own custom templates. There's nothing stopping you from making the field references to anything within your layout part of that template. So as you go to paste in your your layout object or your or your yeah, layout object is the best term, um, you can actually update the uh, dependencies dynamically. So two answers. Yes, it will break. Doesn't always matter that it broke. Um, or if you know that it is going to matter, you can template it using mustache. Um, so uh, really quick, FMSVG, really cool website. Um, I feel like I'm plugging Geist a lot here, but they make some awesome stuff. Uh, Geist hosts this. The guy that wrote this is a really cool guy. His name's Ludi Lepara. Um, and Todd, has, Todd has hosted it for a long time. Um, and when I originally made this, it's a it's again another open source plugin. Uh, it was to monitor a batch of icons in a folder and convert them into FileMaker's uh, format, so to speak. If if anyone's ever worked with um, SVG icons, you know that you can change conditional formatting and change some things about the icon depending on FileMaker calculations if FileMaker has the appropriate styling. So I wrote a plugin, oh, probably like three or more years ago, like a long time ago, um, to actually go through and, and do this and, and parse through the XML appropriately. Um, and Todd put it on a website. It was awesome. Uh, but now I have this, this gateway into developers' desktops. I figured, OK, well. I'll go the next step and I'll create that uh, within Dropship. So it's hidden at the moment because it's not done, but I'm going to show it anyway. Uh, if you go down to the Made With FM Buddies and give it a click somewhere. Well, maybe not. May not. Oh, there we go. Takes a minute. Uh, I have this little Dropship area, right? Just like we saw earlier with the Drop Zone. Move this out of the way. Again, this is all kind of under development. Um, and then I'll open up Noun. Now this is a really cool SVG library. Um, do something thematic. Star Wars seems good. Um, and I have this Boba Fett icon. And I want this Boba Fett icon in FileMaker, right? Um, and if I were to just take it and put it into FileMaker now, that would work, but I wouldn't be able to conditionally format it. So what I've done is I've actually added the um, SVG nader to Dropship. So now when you drag this to Dropship, it'll actually create the SVG icon for you. Currently, it's it's being put on your desktop, but you can configure where that gets put. And uh, now, if I wanted to add that to a button, I could go in and oh, I guess I got to make a button first. And when you say conditionally format, what what example would you view of a conditional formatting to that picture? Yeah. Let's let's do it. Okay. So I'll set up conditional formatting, and I'll add the formula is dollar sign, dollar sign, true. Let's go to one, right? And then the fill color is going to be red. OK, so now this has a conditional formatting to it. I'll save that, go to my data viewer. Probably an easier way to do this, but that's the way I came up with. So, monitor, refresh it. True is one. Oh, there we go. And now the, the conditional formatting is updated. In this case, I don't think I did that correctly because it updated the outline and not the icon itself. That's not what I wanted to do. So now if it's an SVG, if you had like, let's say a map of the United States or something, if you knew all of the parameters, could you conditionally format like a state or a county or? You could, you yeah. could. Okay. Yeah, you could, you could do that sort of thing. That might get a little complicated with SVGs, but you could definitely do that sort of thing. Um, so there, now it's the icon is conditionally formatted. So Dropship added the styling that allows that to happen. Um, and that is hopefully the very first step in a lot of um, layout object transformations we can do to make developers' lives easier. So cool. And that's what I have to show you folks today. Um, thank you very much for having me. I love talking about this stuff. Um, Come check out my stuff. I'm on GitHub most of the time, github.com slash ludog. Um, if you want to join the beta, you're interested, uh, just shoot me um, an email, uh, lou at mute symphony or lou at seedcode.com. Uh, both work really well.
Great. Thank you very much. Um, Lou, good luck with your new job. Thank you. Thank you. Good people. <laughs> All right. Anyone have any other questions? Okay. Well, that was really cool. Thanks a lot. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for having me. Have a good night. See ya. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Lou.